my number 10. Um, and this, this is one that's going to, I think, sting a little bit for you because I, it's a creature. It's so my number 10 is Revenge of the Creature, which as you may have noted, I still haven't ranked the Creature Walks Among Us yet. <laughs> oh no, he's You're doing crazy. something different. I know, I know. I'm a madman. Yes, I understand that traditionally people would rank the creature films in the order that they were made. Um, however, um, I th- and I think this is a great film. It's fun. It jumps right into the action. Right. Um, you don't get more, much more than 10 minutes in and you see the creature. Um, that bit where he pulls the, uh, the heron off of the log. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Like um, I, I, I don't know if that's an actual heron, but God, it looks real. It sure does. It sure does. So, so that poor bird, <laughs> that poor bird, which nowadays they would surely have been sued. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, not, not even a minute after that, they really like it's, this is the creature's film. Mm-hmm. We don't wait 20 minutes. Like we did the first time around. We don't burn its gills off and completely change the makeup design. Right. Um, it is absolutely a lot of monster in this film yeah. for sure. Um, the only reason I ranked it below its sequel and of course ranked it below its first one, which is one of the best films on this list um, is uh, a lot of it just takes place at the aquarium and he's in, and he's chained up the whole time. It doesn't do a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and also when he does finally break free, a lot of this film stops making sense. Um, the fact that he can track down um Oh, what is her name? Yeah. I, I remember I know it's <laughs> I know it's I know it's K in the first film because the first right. one was brilliant and I watch it all the time. Yeah. Um Helen. It's Helen. Yes. He magically manages to track down Helen and how? Yeah. Like he it's so smells her or something. It's no so con- it is so convenient that her hotel is by the water. So convenient. Mm-hmm. Um and it is and how he's able to keep tracking her from there. It's like well, first off, these people are stupid. They need to stay off of the water. Right. Um, um, I ding it a little bit for recycling the uh, the Julia Adams swimming scene. They basically do the same bit with yeah. one other person. I will say, however, the shot that is right beneath the gill man as he's swimming beneath them and you, looking straight up at all three of them right. is brilliant, brilliant shot. Um, I also ding this one because... I don't understand why they had to change the, uh, the design of the creature. Yeah. It's not a whole lot, but it's enough to um, be a bummer. So for a little context in the first film, anytime the creature is underwater, it's eyes are like hollowed out black, like it's a skull yeah. and it's super creepy, but when it's on land, it has more human eyes. So, you know, I imagine you can chalk it up to, I, I of course know it's because you had two different actors in two different suits doing the underwater and the land scenes, Right. But you could logically say that the water has some kind of effect on its eyes. Um, in this film, it has the same looking eyes, both under and out of water. Um, and they're weird. They're weird. They're more amphibious. Yeah, they look like frog's eyes. Um, I do like the, how they're starting to make a connection of how it is more connected to humans than they would have originally thought, which mm-hmm. built, which leads right into the third movie. Right. Um, but yeah, it did for me. The ending just doesn't hold up as much as the first film. Um, again, there's it's so super convenient that it's that he's able to keep tracking Helen wherever she goes. Yes. Um, and I will say though, oh man, she's got some stamina because in the first film, he's only captured Kay for like 10 minutes before right. the end of the film and they rescue her. She has been captured for what feels like hours. Yeah and probably out there in the water mm-hmm. and probably has hypothermia. Yeah. Like, oof. Uh, um, the dog, her dog scene is very cool. Oh, that's so, that's rough. It's rough, but it's very cool. <laughs> it's, it's good. <laughs> I, again, though, it also doesn't make sense. How does she not hear that? It's right outside the bathroom. <laughs> but yeah, at, it's a good scene. Um, yes. Again, the, the creature films altogether are the best, the best arc you're going to get in these films, for sure. Um, what is your number 10? The Mummy, we've already discussed. It's All great. right. 
<laughs> you're, you're good on that? Yep. Okay. Uh, number nine. All right, here we go. It's The Creature Walks Among Us. Oh. Um, so I ranked it higher than Revenge of the Creature um, because, yes, yes, the makeup is... I like the idea of what they do, but yeah, right. it's weird that he suddenly seems bulkier yeah. um, under clothes. But I love, and you made this point earlier, I love the human characters in this film. Yeah, They are incredibly well-defined and they really drive home the point um, that again, this gets dr- driven home a lot in The Shape of Water, that humans are the monsters. Yeah, um, You have the good humans and then you have the terrible husbands who are evil. Right. And it's oh the when he when he kills Grant at the end and just drags the body into the cage and it's like oh we're just gonna blame this on creature here right and creature's like I have an opening no because <laughs> um, that scene is that scene to me is uh, scarier than a lot of stuff in Revenge of the Creature where he's just stalking them in the house right right because that that is uh, that feels like something that's closer to home than anything else in those movies right. um I also think it's uh pretty scary scene where they're all just out in the little motorboat like five people in one motorboat tracking the creature of course before they burn the gills off it's like right this is so stupid why are you doing this he could easily pick you all off one at a time in that thing right they go in with the safety of that giant freaking i don't want to say yacht but it's you know it's 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 like oh why would you think this is a good idea (laughs) Yeah, again, just a bummer of a movie though for yeah poor creature. Uh, that the last <laughs> shot never wanted to be the, there. <laughs> yep, yes. the last shot is uh, it's so good. It's such a good last shot of just yes. staring off into the ocean, knowing full well that he's probably going to die if he goes back in, but he can't help himself. Yeah, and kudos to the continuity folks there in that last shot where he finally steps up through the camera he still has the bullet holes right and the blood right and for, and for the first time it's like oh he's not coming back from these bullet wounds no. this is a monster that has survived getting shot several times mm-hmm. not this time no <laughs> but yeah i love i love I, I love the connections with the characters like how his scientist is he's definitely flirty but he knows he knows when to stop and he knows right. Like he's definitely attracted to Marsha, but he's like, mm, nope, you're married. So yeah. I'm gonna just play it cool. And yeah. then you have stupid Grant, right? Who can't who can't keep in his pants? Yeah. And God, what's the husband's name? He, oh, yeah, he's the worst. <laughs> he's so bad. He is one of the only characters in the, like, as 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 nasty as Mark gets in the first film. He's not nearly as bad. You still feel bad when Mark dies in the first film. Yeah. Yeah. Like everyone who dies in the first two films is like, oh man, this is rough. This is yeah. so sad. Um, and I actually think that no, him, he and Grant are the only characters that die in the third film. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very it's very different of the creature. But uh I absolutely yeah. understand why most most fans would rank it as the least as the worst of the three um right. oh i also love the scene where they're talking to the fisherman oh he describes describes being attacked and he describes the creature as smart like the devil right so yeah it's i I think it's better than most fans give it credit for but it is i understand why people rank it as low as they right. do um again though creature films between the three of them yeah you're not you're not getting a better cohesive yeah uh set of films in this set right well, my next one is Revenge of the Creature. So we've already discussed. <laughs> Anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, no. Um, not that I can think of. I just, I love Lucas coming back. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a nice <laughs> we'll, touch. We'll get to him later, but so great. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll jump right into number nine then. So uh, I've only got two 1940s. No, I have three. Whoa, wow, wow, I have three 1940s films in the top 10. Crazy. <laughs> um, uh, my number eight is Son of Dracula. The same. <laughs> um, it's, I think it's, I, I know this one probably gets overlooked by most people who go into this because it's not Bela Lugosi. Right. Um, but like you said, cool. with the curse, um, that setting, 
in the deep South, probably yeah. Louisiana, but not, you know, it's never truly disclosed. Right. Um, it's perfect for a vampire film. Yeah. Um, Very cool. And Cheney brings the, the menace that Christopher yeah. Lee would bring, yeah. you know, 15 years later. Um, he's a good Dracula. Yeah. Um, the scene where he floats across the swamp on his coffin is like, yeah. that's like nothing you ever saw in, in the first film. Oh, so good. Um, and what a bizarre, again, kind of like Dracula's daughter, what a bizarre take with all the other vampires in this film. Um, how, how Kay is, uh, I want to become a vampire. And, you know, you, you first, you think she wants to just become Dracula's bride. Right. And then the whole plot is turned on its head when she reveals, I don't, I need you to kill Dracula. And then I'll turn you into a vampire. And, you know, my, my lover for my whole life, and we will be vampire lovers for all eternity. Right. It's like, Oh my God. God, that is messed up. It's yeah, it's good, man. <laughs> but yeah, it's great. Um, I, I absolutely agree with the criticism of why at the end of the film, when Dracula is, you know, trying to put out the fire in his coffin, it's like, why does he try to smash it with wood? Um, that seems counterintuitive when you're trying to put out a fire, especially when you're sitting right next to a pool of water. Um, right. So it's, it does see, yeah, it is a little counterintuitive, but I love his speech right before where he says, uh, if you knew who I really was, you would have come at sunrise. Right. right. And uh, backing up into the fire, right. that shot is brilliant. And uh, his death is, you know, when he looks up and there's the sun and he just collapses into the water and his yeah. hand just sort of melts away. Yep. Um, that That is the precursor to Christopher Lee's face melting off mm -hmm. right there. Yep. So yeah, I think I think this film owes I think Hammer owes a lot more to Son of Dracula than it does yeah. to Bela Lugosi. I think it owes yeah more to, to Son of Dracula than it does to John Carradine's. Not because of John Carradine's performance, but because Dracula doesn't do that much right. in those two films. Um. So yeah, Son of Dracula. Um. Creepy gothic yeah. romance vampires before True Blood was a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, they they knew they knew they knew to set it in the South. They know yeah. it's a creepy place. I know. I love them. Uh, oh, we didn't mention it's Alucard, right? Yes. <laughs> like that was really years. <laughs> in 1943, several years before the Castlevania video game franchise popularized that name, Son of Dracula. And of course, it is revealed that it is just Dracula. I've seen, I've read way too many synopses of this film that mischaracterize his role. They literally like, oh yeah, he's the son of Dracula. Like, no, no, no. Did you not watch the end of the film? He's Dracula. <laughs> right. Again, doesn't make sense in the continuity of Dracula's daughter and Dracula before it. Right. I, I almost see it as sort of a standalone film. Right. Yeah, it's great though. The I, I agree the whole southern uh, atmosphere is so good. Oh, we haven't even talked about like one of the first scenes where she goes to see uh, where Kay goes to see uh, the fortune teller in the swamp. Oh, yeah. That's so good with the, the creepy yeah. fortune teller and the bat just flies in. Yeah. It's great. Um, yeah, just the use of the of the swamp in that movie is um, oh, and, and when uh, when Frank shoots at Dracula and shoots right through him. And it's framed perfectly. Like you can see Frank in the doorway and you can see Dracula right. and then Kay collapses behind him. It's, it's so brilliantly yeah. shot. So yeah. Um, my, yeah, my personal favorite of all the Dracula films in that set. Agreed. Um, I get it. I get Bela Lugosi, you know, iconic and everything, but man, well, story-wise they, they took it in a great direction there. He's great. So that was your number eight too. So yeah, yeah. we are spot on. Okay. Yeah, so let's see if we can get number seven as well. My number seven is Son of Frankenstein. Nope. Ah, dang it. Okay. Um, the last of the 1930s horror films, the last Boris Karloff Frankenstein film. I got to say, buddy, this is my favorite one. It's not my number one, but it's my personal favorite one <laughs> it's a good it is a good film um you can i tell, love this movie <laughs> you can tell that uh this this film came to be because uh they they stopped making horror films about 1935 oh pardon me um 
and then they did the the Frankenstein Dracula double bill revival mm-hmm. in 38 and it was so hugely successful that they jumped back in right. um and they this is with the exception of Phantom of the Opera um this is the film in this set that looks like they gave it a nice chunk of a budget yep. the sets in this are grand the yep. house is wonderful yep. the castle is just the broken down lab every- yep they they went all out with this one, and it's a shame that after this, these films were relegated to to, to B films. Yeah, that because they proved it. They proved these things still have life in them, and oh, to bring in Bela Lugosi in what you know again, most iconic role is Dracula. His best role, bar none, is in this film as Igor. So good, so. Uh, good. Um, I've, I've heard that it was supposed to be Dwight Fry. I'm glad that it ended up being Bela Lugosi. Dwight Fry would have done a great job with it, right. but, um, and this is the, f- I, the first film throughout most of these, I think to feature Lionel Atwill in a major That's role so good. as Inspector Krogh. And this, um, for all of you young Frankenstein fans out there, yeah, um, it's, it's this movie. <laughs> it's this. It's basically a remake of this movie. And, and of course, Young Frankenstein borrows liberally from Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. But the basic story is this film. Yeah. Um, and so much, um, you know, Inspector Kemp in that one is that's ripped right out of this. The darts. Yep. Uh, and even even the stuff where uh, even the downtime where you don't get a lot of monster Igor. Um, it's Basil Rathbone. Yeah. Um, he is so good. He is. Um, it is it is such a shame he couldn't bring him back for Ghost yeah. of Frankenstein. He, like, you know, obviously it would have been great to get Colin Clive back, but I believe he had passed away by then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, too early. Um, but Basil Rathbone and Lionel Atwill, you know, it's like, there's not a, there's not a bad moment in this no. film. No, um, I mean, that we, art scene is so good. <laughs> we are, you know, I, I've got a couple here that, people might other people might rank lower but we are i think from here on out we're at the cream of the crop yeah like Agreed. yeah i'm gonna have some biases but we are really we are there yes like i said this is my personal favorite one <laughs> it's I, I i know there are ones that are technically better but i love this movie <laughs> yep i igor so is much. Great. uh the monster gets the vest, the iconic vest, which I, I know you know I'm a sucker for. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do actually, I will, I'll also concede to Karloff's criticism of why doesn't the monster talk anymore? Yeah. It is weird. It, it, if they had explained it, that might be a little bit better. But yeah, it is weird. And that's definitely one reason I can see why Karloff was ready to, right. to let this role go. And um, they were originally going to do it in color, were they not? They Definitely, there's definitely a uh, a test reel in color, right. and I believe you can actually just YouTube it. Yeah, it's great. Um, I, you know, they, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the plan. Um, this was 30, 1939. This was, right. you know, their big return. Um, and I think what thirty nine wasn't. I think the Wizard of Oz was thirty nine. It would have been yeah, the perfect year so. to release a color monster film. Yeah. Um, but you know, we weren't we weren't going to get our Technicolor monster films discounting Phantom of the Opera mm-hmm. until 1957. Yeah. So yeah, uh, but yeah. Now we, I can't say enough about Bela as Igor. Just. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's Says something stuck in my throat when he yep. coughed. Oh, like, oh, so good. <laughs> Menacing but hilarious. So good. Uh, yeah um he really like you know it's you know it's a frankenstein film it's car it's a karloff monster but it's it's this is a this is lugosi stealing yeah a lot yeah um it's it's almost payback for you know karloff basically taking over as the king of horror a year after bela lugosi right not even a year after bela lugosi had Mm -hmm. you know originated that title right um, for the, yeah, for those of you who don't know this, Bela Lugosi was supposed to play the Frankenstein monster um, yeah. and turned it down in 1931 because he thought, um, I don't, I, this makes it sound bad, but it's true. He thought it was beneath him because yeah, the monster, he the and monster posters, you can see posters where they already had it. Bela Lugosi, Frankenstein. Yep. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, there's supposedly 
test reels out there of him in, in a completely different type of makeup. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he just turned it down. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a shame. And he definitely regrets that. And cool. that's why he took it later in Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Yeah. And it's, it sucks that by then the role itself had just been whittled down to yeah. Yeah. a real, something really dull. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, son of Frankenstein. Um, I'm sure I'll let you blather on about it as well. When we get there, what's your number seven? (laughs) My number seven is Dracula. We've already discussed. Uh, Yeah. And I put it higher than some of the other ones that I kind of like better, but Dwight, I, I kept going down the list and I got to Dwight Fry and I was like, God, he's so good. He is. (laughs) You and I had the, uh, the grand fortune um, five years ago to see, Dracula and its uh, Spanish language counterpart uh, back to back in a movie theater. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it really seeing Dwight Fry on the big screen. Um, that was the best part of seeing yeah. it on the big screen was Dwight Fry's performance because yeah. you can really, really see into his eyes at that point. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, it it doesn't seem like much at first, but then it, it's on the ship. Yeah. Um, when he finally when you finally see how mad he has gone. Um, and that's his his descent. Yeah, it's great. Insanity is, yeah. So yeah, it's higher on the list than like the Mummy, which I actually like better, and uh, Son of Dracula, I even like better. But man, it's all Dwight. It's all him. It's a performance for the ages. Yeah, it's great. Um, I'm gonna move on. Uh to my number six. So we've already talked about this film, but I'm going to talk about it more because this is a very important one for me. Um, and I, this, this one is probably close to one of my personal favorites and it is yeah. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. I know um, it. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, I, I call this one of the films that I knew before I was born. Yeah. Like I, I don't know when I saw it. I know I probably shouldn't have seen it as early as I did. Um, <laughs> But I saw this film before The Wolfman and probably around the same time as Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. Just because of the way these movies were released over the years, so many of them were not available. Right. This was one of the few right. that was available on a very old VHS. Which I remember kindly. <laughs> um, so, um, and it's all about The Wolfman. Um, you know, it's great that there's a Frankenstein monster in this, but it, this is all Larry Talbot for me. Yeah. Um every transformation scene in this film is perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um the scene, my favorite shot. I've talked about favorite scenes. My favorite shot, just my in any of these films, is when the villagers are chasing the wolfman and he just grabs the branch of, of that's sticking out of the ground and snarls at them. Great. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's that's Lon Chaney. Loving, yeah. loving what he's doing right now. Um, this is also a movie. Um, I have st- I have tried to write the remake of this movie in my head so many times <laughs> uh, because um, I would I would keep a lot of what makes it great about the Wolfman, but I would like I would make it Mary Shelley's monster, right? Um, and change the ending so that the monster is the hero. I think it's fun that the Wolfman kind of comes off as a hero at the end of the film. Um, right. but it makes no sense. Right. Um, but yeah, I love, I love Lon Chaney's film and I love Maria Uspenskaya as Maliva and her Latin so who it's a shame that she, I don't know if she survived after this film, but, and her character just mysteriously vanishes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but her last moment, um, it, it's so, it hits so hard. Um, when she, all she's, um, was it Elsa and Frank are talking about, you know, you need to fix this problem we have with the Frankenstein monster. Right. This guy's insane. And Maliva just says, he's not insane. He simply wants to die. Right. And just walks away and say, like, oh my God. Yeah. I, this is, this is my son of Frankenstein in I a way. It. I can't, I, I can't, I, knew it. <laughs> I can't say enough about this film. So I'm going to shut up about it because because we are we've been talking a lot so uh your number six what is your number six my number six is the invisible man james wales uh claude rains 
uh, what's the innkeeper's name? Uh, oh, you know Connor? Yeah. Oh, great. He's so good. <laughs> yeah, this one's great. This is uh this is my number five. So let's let's cool. get this ball rolling. This okay, is we're cool, in a yeah. perfect spot right here. Um, yeah, Claude Rains. No one knew Claude Rains. Yeah. I mean, no one knew Karloff or Lugosi, but like, right? Like this is this is a rare instance of an actor who started in a horror movie who would go on to be known for so much more right. than just horror. Right. So it, it he's one of the lucky few who escaped it and right. then went back to do it again. <laughs> Um, but, uh, I, I love the story of how he, uh, a lot the, when he went into audition, um, a, everyone who was there except for James Whale said he bombed the audition oh, and, I didn't James, know that. and James Whale said, I don't care. Did you hear his voice? It's great. Cause, uh, he, I guess he went in there and he, the story is that he basically treated as he would a theater audition and he was very theatrical and big oh. and, and too, you know, too big for film. But James Will said that voice is everything. Right. Um, and it is, right. <laughs> it is, right. it is the best voice in this entire pantheon of films. <laughs> no one sounds as good in these films as Claude Rains. Yeah. yeah. And he had to mm -hmm. uh, under all those bandages for the whole film. Yeah. yeah. Or just unseen. Right. Um, and oh, those effects are great. Oh my God. We've talked to, we've already talked about how those films were ahead of their time. Um, this one, especially yeah. um, like, no, this is, this came out the same year as King Kong. And if not for Kong, everyone would talk about the invisible man as the best right. special effects movie of that year. Yep. Um, yeah. It's phenomenal. Um, and I, I think, I even think that they were, uh, they, I think in the, some of the later films like Invisible Man's Revenge, they got a little lazy because you can start to see strings attached to things. Right. In this one, there's so fewer instances of um, stuff that gets carried. It is more him right. um, running around without a head. Mm -hmm. um, and it works so well. Um, and he is, he, and you know, he's terrifying as well. Um, right. the, uh, the moon, even the moon's frightened of me. Right into death. <laughs> um, one of the best monologues. Yeah. Um, and I'm so glad that uh, James Whale chose to do this film. Right. Yeah, let's um, because, talk about James Whale. How, how phenomenal is he? <laughs> yeah. Um, you will hear about James Whale two more <laughs> times. And I have a feeling I know I know what positions they are going to be on this list. Yeah. Um, they're certainly going to be close together in, in yep. regards to how we did this. Um, so yeah, he he started with Frankenstein, and uh, this was the film he did before Bride of Frankenstein. Um, yeah, I I believe he I believe he chose this one himself, right? Um, and got uh, he chose the writer too. Um, so this was really like before Orson Welles came about. You know, James Welles one of the first auteurs, right? Um, had so he was lucky to have so much control over the films that he made. Um, most of the, actually most of the horror directors of the thirties for universal had a lot of control. It wasn't until the forties when the Lemleys um, right. sort of had left the studio or, or had been pushed out of the studio um, that they sort of started to become um, what's the term I'm looking for, you know, just higher, cat basically. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, this is yeah, just a, yeah. just a brilliant piece of filmmaking. Yeah, um, yeah. great blend of horror and humor, probably, you know, and it's not always, it's, it's funny. And sometimes it's very uncomfortable, funny. Um, it's the, this is a rare instance where, um, you're both rooting for and against this character, right? Because you know, deep down that he is inherently good. Right. And that uh that it's the drug that does it. Right. And it's it's the damn villagers at the end <laughs> if they just leave them alone. <laughs> They're great characters, all of them, especially Jenny. But yeah, if they just leave them alone, <laughs> yep. the work thing. Yeah, it's great. Um, and I'm gonna go off on a little bit of a tangent here. Um I would say I, I made a slight error earlier. Um, 
when I talked about the mummy being the best, um, I have to watch it again. I have it at home. Um, the, the recent invisible man movie is actually really good. It's not, it is not the HG Wells story. (laughs) Right. Um, for sure. Um, but it takes, it takes the concept of an invisible predator and really throws it into a great modern story. Um, talk about gaslighting. Right. Um, Have you seen it? Yes. It's great. great. Yeah. Great film. Um, and I'm really, I'm really glad that I, th- I think that director has been tapped to do Dracula. Oh, sweet! So, I'm glad, I'm glad it's him because he clearly has a reverence for good horror films, and he knows how to make a good modern horror film. Right? Because, uh, yeah. Um, but watch, watch the 1933 film; it's great. Watch the 2020 film. Um, oof, that was the last. That was the last new film I saw in a movie theater. Yeah. Then I saw King Kong. So that was the last <laughs> actual movie I saw in a movie. It's been a crazy year. Yeah. Woo. It's been a crazy year. <laughs> oh. What's, what's your number five? My number five is Son of Frankenstein. Oh. If you I have anything say, more to say, say no, it. Do it. I love it. I just love okay. it. <laughs> All right. So we talked so much about that one higher, but I know there are better, actually better movies. <laughs> I, I did that with a film and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about soon. Um, so my number four is creature from the black lagoon. Oh, you surprised me then. <laughs> um, this is um, again, this is actually um, if not for the fact that there are two films we have yet to touch on that are from a historical standpoint, um, much more important. Right. Um, creature would be higher right um but this um of all the films on on this list this is the one that still actually kind of scares me yeah um they did a great job as a kid (laughs) yep um man this yeah this film legitimately scared me as a kid um you know the wolfman couldn't do it frankenstein couldn't do it this is the one and it's on in in every in almost every instance it's the scene where you can't see the monster right yeah. Um, the music is oh. absolutely terrifying. Yes. The monster roar is. Yeah. It's, it's it, the only like, you know, the Wolfman roars, but like this thing roars. It's something yeah. it's something you don't you can't understand. Yeah. Um, and of, and also it should be noted, too, of all the, the films on this list, apart from the Abbott and Costello films, which are also late in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, these are the only the creature films, the only three that were done in the 50s. Mm-hmm. Um, they're really sort of they stand out because they're not gothic, yeah. Um, they are modern, yeah. Um, and in the 50s, this was you know, but in the 50s, this was the closest you could get to sort of a traditional monster movie, right? Universal was doing this island earth, you know, they were doing right. aliens, they were doing tarantula, right. Everyone was doing giant bugs. Yeah, the atomic age. Yep. Yeah. Sci-fi was the thing, but this was the really the only sci-fi monster that was traditionally scary. Yeah. So, and uh, it's yeah, it's it's it still is, and there's, yeah. um, I I consider it an absolute uh, testament to Rico Browning's ability to. Uh, perform Mm -hmm. underwater yeah um he would you know and again no one no studio would let an actor get away with this today Mm -hmm. um insurance would be absolutely at their throats but you know back in 1954 and actually through all these films rico browning does this stuff underwater and he held he would hold his breath for up to four minutes to do these scenes right like oh my god no what a champ to put someone in a suit like that yeah. and expect them to perform underwater. And he does, he performs this. It's a character. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, it's not stiff. You can, you can tell that this creature is, you know, it's processing. It's trying right. to figure things out. And nowhere is that better personified than in the scene where he's stalking Kay when Kay. she takes her dive into the water. Mm-hmm. Um, and and to, to have filmed that too underwater, to catch it in the frames that they did is so good. Right. Like th- from a technical standpoint, this really is uh, the best of right. these films. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, absolutely. The underwater stuff that they did in Creature, because, um, uh, I mean, 
you don't even see too much of underwater stuff. You never really do see much underwater stuff anymore. No. Um, this film and uh, Disney's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and then Thunderball in 1965 right. are like the three best examples of live action underwater films. Right. Um, everything else you can tell is usually done like on a set. Even later Bond films would do stuff like with special effects that simulate underwater. Right. Um and I mean, yes, sometimes you do get real underwater stuff, but nothing feels as grand as those yeah. three films in particular. Yeah. Um, and for horror films, this film. Yeah. Um, the next closest thing you get to a great underwater horror film is Jaws. Right. And again, that was, um, that even has a sense, you can even, after seeing Jaws, there's a sense of, uh, they had control. Right. Like this, a lot of the, a lot of this was filmed you know, it wasn't filmed in the Amazon. That would have been very dangerous, but uh, for reasons other than <laughs> other than creatures. Um, right. But it was filmed like, what? Well, it was off the coast of Florida, right? Yeah, yeah. So yep. yeah. And yes, yes, some of this was filmed on the back lot at Universal and they do an amazing job dressing that back lot Thank up you. as the Amazon. Mm -hmm. But, oh. I know. The, uh, and then of course. The cast. The the cast great julie adams be still my heart yep <laughs> uh what's lucas nestor uh i can't pronounce his last name i don't know i can't pronounce it either but he's great he's great. so fun yep. yeah um and just i like this is this is i've talked about this already this is this is the perfect movie where you do hold off with showing the monster for like 20, almost 30 minutes in, but you get to see those glimpses. Right. And that first shot um, where they swim over the ledge right. and then it pops up and almost grabs them. And that music. <laughs> um, I've posted a gif of that on, on social media several times. It's such, it's perfect. Yes, it um, that and uh the scene where it pop where he pops up out of the water in the dark when they're yes. trying to find him with the lantern. Yeah. Um, so great. There's also a, there's a great, <laughs> this is totally off topic, but there's a great little, a very long gif of, and I won't say it. Um, it's the creature. It's every, t it's like different shots of the creature across all three films. Oh, like either yeah. wrecking stuff. And it says F this, F <laughs> that, F that. <laughs> it's like, Oh man. Yeah. Cause he, the creature is, you know, we're in the fifties now that these films finally get a little bit more violent. Yeah. Yeah. It is a violent, violent monster. Yeah. Ah, oh, okay. I've blathered on too much about this one. What is your number four? My number four is the Wolfman. Good choice. Yes. Uh, Lon Chaney, Bella as the gypsy Bella. <laughs> uh, Maria, what's her name again? Uspenskaya. Oh, she's so good. Ooh. Yep. Gives me chills. Give me goosebumps every time I watch it. Uh, yeah. Great. Again, I, the one thing I have against it is the whole, where does this take place? When does this take place? <laughs> yeah, the uh, the timeline is very weird, especially once they merge it with the Frankenstein timeline one movie later. Right. Because you get the sense that this is kind of a modern film because they have cars. Right. Um, kind of actually like Son of Frankenstein. The leap right. between Son of Frankenstein and Ghost of Frankenstein is weird because they go from cars to horse carriages. Right. You don't know why. Yeah. So, so it's weird. Yeah. Um, I actually, you know, it. I, I, I feel like this is one fact about the film I should have known, but like the, the sets they build to simulate the forest are so good. They just, I never realized those were sets. Right. Like yeah. the fog is perfect. Mm -hmm. Like I always, to me, that's just, that is, it's so good. It may as well be the woods. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's phenomenal, man. Uh, Lon Chaney is just so damn good. He's um, It's so the, sad. <laughs> yeah. It is the only, it is the only film of, of the 1940s that came close to capturing that same lightning in a bottle of the early thirties films. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, after after that, it was, you know, I say this knowing we both love these films, but it was downhill from there. <laughs> um, yeah. And even and even then, I understand why the Wolfman is not held in as, in as high regard as Dracula, Frankenstein, and Bride of Frankenstein, 
or even the invisible man and the mummy. Right. Um, you know, they, they were already, they were 10 years into doing this. So right. it took them that long to get a werewolf film that right. finally hit a chord with audiences. And, and an important say, one. Yeah. We should say basically all of the werewolf lore that most people are familiar with come from this movie. Yeah. Author Kurt Siodmax um, yeah. created so much of what we now associate with werewolves. I, I believe he, so I believe the full moon yep, is full attributed moon. to him. Um, silver well, is. So, well, well, hmm, maybe, yeah, I, I might be wrong. Well, um, I don't know because silver was silver was already part of the lore of a, a witch, lot of a witchcraft and stuff, and so. There's the Beast of Jevadon story from France way back in the day, a supposed real, real werewolf story. And there's a silver bullet in that story. But I think that that is more of a modern glomming onto that part of it. I don't think that's originally in the story. I think it really does come from this. Uh, Wolfsbane, though. Yeah, Wolfsbane. Uh, Wolfsbane. Um, the poem, even though the poem legally can't be used in other films because that is a universal copyright right there um but um yeah the po like both poems actually both poems are really good yeah and it's a shame they don't use the the uh the way you walk was thorny poem ever again in the other movies yeah. um but it is it that is really kind of her uh maliva's poem mm -hmm. um it really and without her that yeah and again, this is like Son of Frankenstein. This is a, uh, and this is actually my number three. So I'm glad <laughs> we're here. Um, this is a film where even the non-monster scenes are just so yeah. good. Yeah. Um, the the funeral procession for Bela is oh, yeah. so it's so haunting. The score for it is. Uh, this is again. This is a uh, a lot of this music would be used later in other Wolfman movies, but some of the stuff like the score for Bayless funeral um, is unique to this film and it's perfect. Right. Um, it is. Um, and uh, I love that. I, I love the scene where they go to church yeah. and he looks down and everyone in the church looks back at him and he realizes I can't be here. Right. Um, whether it's because he's uncomfortable or it's because he knows that there's an evil in him that can't be there. It's right. Um, I, I, I love I love that Universal made the decision to actually show the werewolf because um, I know in the original script, Kurt Siodmak wanted it to be a mystery right. throughout most of the film and never actually show anything. Um, but this is a monster movie. Yeah. So um, they they do shed that, you know, all of his friends and family shed enough doubt for there to right. you know, for us to understand how how incredible it sounds. Right. Um, and again, what a cast! Claude yeah. Rains making his return, yeah, um, as as Sir John Talbot, mm. Evelyn Anchors as the love interest. Um, oh gosh, uh, Warren William as Doctor Lloyd. Um, this is God, this has got to have the maybe one of the best ensembles next to maybe Son of Frankenstein. Yeah, um, Ralph Bellamy, mm -hmm. um, Bela Lugosi, Maria Spinskaya, everyone in this film, like. Yeah. They knock it out of the park. Yeah, they do. Um, and again, the, there's there are little criticisms that we've already talked about with Werewolf of London, like uh, you know his first transformation. Uh, Larry is wearing his undershirt; he's wearing nothing else, and then he's suddenly out and about, and he's fully dressed. And it's like, right. where where'd the clothes come from? <laughs> right. And uh, yeah. That actually, I have to bring this one up because this one I just thought about today, and I don't know how I didn't think of this. And Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. How does Larry go from under the castle, reviving the monster from the ice, right? You know, having been chased by the villagers and having no resources, to in the next scene he meets Elsa Frankenstein in the most wonderful, delight, like perfect suit, right? Like he's been to the tailor. Like, where'd you get the money for that? Yeah. You are a wandering gypsy at this point. <laughs> no sense, but whatever. So yeah, Wolfman never knows what to do with his clothes. Yes. Um, um, I, I rank this one at three because uh, this would be my number one, but there are two films. There are two films that I, I cannot deny are so important. <laughs> um, uh, 
this this one has like the most Shakespearean ending to me. Yeah. Like just absolutely tragic. Um, so spoiler alert for all of you out there. So his father, of course, does not believe him when he says I'm a werewolf. But at the end of the film, it's dad who kills him mm-hmm. with the same silver cane that he had used to kill the wolf that bit him. Yeah. So it is, yeah, absolutely the biggest twist of fate mm-hmm. uh, that you're going to see in in these films. It's, it is absolutely heartbreaking and it does not get easier for Larry Talbot for three no. more films. Yep. He's a sad character. Um, but uh, well, to go talk a little bit of history here. Uh, so Lon Chaney Jr. is, of course, the, the son of Lon Chaney Sr., Lon Chaney Sr. was known as the man of a thousand faces. He did his own makeup for almost every role he did. Um, His makeup for Phantom of the Opera and Hunter of Notre Dame is iconic Mm -hmm. um, among horror fans. Um, uh, Lon Chaney Jr. was born Creighton Chaney, Mm -hmm. and his father did not want him to get into acting. Um, He expressly forbid it. And uh, when, when dad passed away, that became young Creighton's chance to finally break in to acting. Um, but uh, he, he didn't have a great start. He played a lot of, uh, he was in a lot of uh, like mafia movies playing, you know, just tough guys. Yep. Um, it wasn't until uh, of mice and men yep. he played Lenny and that was his big shot and it paid off and universal said, Hey, you're a big guy and we need a big guy to be in our monster movies. And, the Wolfman um, was sort of his way of saying, screw you, dad. And you can see it yeah. in his performance. Mm-hmm. Um, it is um, it is his role. Um, yep. He's the only actor to have played the Wolfman in all of those movies. Every other monster yep. um, had, had was played by multiple, except, of course, for the Phantom of the Opera. But, you know, again, it's the only one that's not a franchise. Okay. Um, <laughs> So it and, and and that remained true until 2010 when it was remade with Benicio del Toro. So mm-hmm. only two actors have ever played this role, right? Um, a role that surprisingly hasn't been like redone even more over right. the course of the years. Um, and to to Benicio del Toro's credit, he does a good job too. Yeah. Um, they they were they did well to cast him, and uh, I I enjoy the Wolfman, but again, the ending is very big and boisterous and unnecessary yeah. Yeah. um and i i don't like the relationship between him and his father as much in the remake yeah no one thing i do like about the remake over the original though is i uh i do like how the romance between larry and gwen develops in the remake because he's kind of a creeper in the original yes he is it's, <laughs> um you know it I can't, I can't just ignore that. He is, you know, he's hitting, he's hitting on a woman who is engaged and is saying no several times. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know what? He kind of, he kind of pays the price for that. Plus not to mention he uh, only goes there because he's spying on her through a telescope. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. He is. So yep. thankfully his character becomes much more sympathetic as the movies go on. Right. Right. And I, I, you know, but yeah. He, he does not start off as the most likable by today's, <laughs> by today's standards yes, yes. back, back then that, that kind of behavior was yeah. probably passing as acceptable. And that's yeah. cool. Great. 1940s. You can go <laughs> away now. Um, what is your number three? My number three is the creature from the black lagoon. Ah, no surprise there. Yep. Uh, it's just great. Well, in that case, I'm going to say my number two and one, because I have a feeling a gut feeling that we've got this in the same order right here. Uh, number two is Frankenstein and number one is Bride of Frankenstein. Yes, we do. We certainly do. Um, again, uh, not because these are my personal favorites, but if uh, I was going to be recommending these films to to someone who's never seen them, right? those are the two films I would say you should start with. Yeah. Um, because James Whale did so much to... and James Whale and uh, the writers. Um, I think it was. I think it was John Balderston for Frankenstein, and then he brought in. Oh, the writer of. It was the writer of the Invisible Man who wrote Bride. Right, Colin Clive is Doctor Frankenstein. Um, we got, well, in Frankenstein in thirty one, we got Dwight 
Dwight Fry as Fritz. Uh, you know who I loved this last time I watched it that I don't think I ever picked up on is uh, Frankenstein's dad. Um, what's the actor's name? Yeah. Frederick Kerr. Man, he's delightful. He is so funny. Yeah. I don't I don't ever remember how great he was, but this last time I watched it, I was like, man, that guy's great. Just this bumbling old baron. He's just great. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. It's uh, RC Sheriff is the name of the playwright who wrote The Invisible Man and uh c- and contributed to Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. Yep. So and, but yeah, that the cast of Frankenstein is uh, poor Dwight Fry though doesn't get nearly as much to do yeah. this time. But he's still he's he's very fun as Fritz. Yes, um, I think it's a shame that most people probably would go into it thinking, "Oh, it's Igor." Yeah, because no one no one gets that Igor was not part no. of the original story. Yeah, he's just that popular. Yep. Um. Yeah, he's a nasty little guy, isn't he? Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, Jack Pierce makeup, so um, good. so iconic. Um, yeah. like I said, everyone, whenever you say Frankenstein, everyone thinks of that, the flat head, the bolts, the sunken yeah. cheeks. So yeah. he, yeah, he did so much. And even though it was not nearly what Mary Shelley described, it was, yeah, it, it's, it horrified people back in the day. Right. It didn't scare us as kids. We were totally cool with it. Right. I, I, I think it also just didn't scare kids back then either, though, was the yeah. thing. I think it just scared most, mostly scared the adults. Right. Because, of yeah. course, kids, kids always understand the monster. Yes, they do. Um, yeah, that the first scene where you see the monster, where he comes in backwards. And, oh, it's great, man. It's great. Comes in back. Not as he comes in backwards and he turns around and then we get progressively closer to yeah. the face yeah it's it's cool. it's absolutely not a normal method of revealing right um, anything but it's perfect yeah and then i don't know you want to go into both of them at once or what man i mean they're both- uh, that these two films are uh they are so inherently tied together more so than dracula and dracula's daughter mm-hmm. um there is of course a little bit of continuity and changing over the course of the two films um you have a new actress playing elizabeth in bride of frankenstein um and his and baron frankenstein and his inexplicably dies between the two films <laughs> um, even <laughs> even though he's there at the end of the first film and yeah. you have a happy ending right. um, that happy ending is basically retconned by the beginning of the second film right but otherwise, it actually it does. It picks up right where they left off. Mm-hmm. Um, and Bride is the, Dr. Pretorius, man, Ernest Thesiger, um, you know, a, char- a character that never existed in yeah. the story. Yeah. Who comes in and uh, like. So campy. Oh, it's great. Yep. It's great. Uh, he does to Bride what Igor did to Son of Frankenstein. Yeah. Like every scene he is in, it, it's his scene. Yeah. Um, the curious little creations that he has. You know, I wish I had remembered this. I had just heard that I think it's an old silent movie or something from Germany where that whole scene is basically there. Um, huh. And I couldn't find where I read that right before I did this, but uh, yeah, what a great scene, man. Yep. And, uh, Lewis and guys, yeah. oh man, they're great. And I, we, I gotta say, I mean, big, big ups to your pops, man. I mean, oh yeah. Yeah. Bride of Frankenstein was on almost every day. <laughs> there are, yeah, a handful of movies that would consistently be on in this house. Um, And when DVDs were a thing, he could put them on repeat, which was even better for him. Um, One was Goldfinger um, and the other was Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, They were constantly on just as background noise. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
And of course, kudos to my dad for introducing me to these films, yeah. period. Um, I don't know. I know you were introduced another way, but um, I, I know that my dad hammered them in for both of us. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, I mean, Bride of Frankenstein is the best one anyway, but I, I think even if it wasn't, I still would rank it there just because sentimental reasons. <laughs> uh, sen- yeah, sentimental and just historical. Like, yeah. um it's so it's so important um and not not a single frankenstein movie that has been made since by universal or otherwise is as highly regarded yeah um and uh that that's coming from me who loves peter cushing's frankenstein <laughs> films to death but yeah. they're they're not as iconic they're not yeah. as yeah they're not as important no um yeah elsa lancaster is the bride and mary shelley i love that little yep beginning there that's great 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 little intro even though even though once you know more about mary shelley's life it's like oh man this is (laughs) this is hollywood really softening that up but you know what it's even it's that's right but like uh i don't know if she gets credit in the first movie does she um i don't think that i don't think they even in the credits i don't know that's a good question she's probably credited on like imdb because right exactly um but you might be right so i kind of so i like that that at least they give props to um yeah because i i it might be i'll have to watch it again darn um (laughs) i i think they uh i think they credit john balderston for the stage adaptation because right. that's what they drew heavily from but right. they might they might but i think they credit balderston more in the actual right. credits you know what it should also be noted and this is interesting um both dracula and frankenstein apart from their opening credits are don't have a score yeah um and dracula suffers for it and frankenstein does not yeah it's weird huh um and i, I credit it all to james whale yeah um because like i said todd browning was a silent movie maker this Ooh. this film feels like a state this film feels like a stage play. Mm-hmm. Frankenstein is very cinematic by comparison. Um, even with the lack of music, the amount of sound effects right. and crazy gadgetry that's going off throughout that entire yeah. film more than makes up for it. Yeah. And uh, you can tell that, um, that Frankenstein didn't suffer for the lack of a score um, by the fact that, uh, what was it, 90, late 90s? I think it was 99. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dracula was re-released um, to... Uh, video and DVD for the first time, and uh, you could watch it with a new score by uh, right. oh Philip Glass. Yeah, and uh, it is also not good. Um, <laughs> it, it just feels awkward. It feels yeah. forced. Yeah, nice little nice little bit of history. Um, oh gosh, we blathered on a lot about this. So I want to talk now about the films we think should be yes. in this set. Um, again, I would take out for sure. I would take out the Invisible Woman and She Wolf of London. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'd love to make it more than 30 to get all these movies I want in there, Mm -hmm. but those are the two I would definitely take out if I needed to replace them. Right. Um, I'll, I'll go one at a time. We'll go back and forth because I think I have six. Okay. I just, Um, I don't know how many I have. Um, the first one I've actually mentioned already, and I think it's very significant to monster movie history and that's Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. Um, if I had the choice, um, not nothing against the Claude Rains version, but I would switch it out. Me too. That's it's, also on my list. It's it's great. If you haven't watched it, go see it. Um, I mean, there's the stuff in the Rains version that's that's just doesn't um, like the Rains version is sadly missing, like the Red Death, right? Uh, which is a huge and uh, it it Cheney's version really does just feel more like an opera ghost the way it's right. described. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that film is, I'm almost certain it, it's got to be in the public domain because uh, mm-hmm. so many versions of it have been released on home video, right? Um, by different uh, studios, but yeah. never Universal. Mm-hmm. I, I wish Universal would just get it back. I know right. they can. They can just release it. Right. Um, there's a there's a great DVD out there. Um, I I think I hope there's a Blu-ray version of it, but there's a DVD version that has like two or three different uh, cuts of the film. Oh wow. Um, cause it, it's one, it is, it's one of those films that was 
like lost to history for a time mm-hmm. or re-released. And it's like, oh man, thank God it still right. exists because so many films from that era are gone. Right. Um, so, yeah. It's great, man. Uh, I mean, in particular, the scene where he's, the crowd's chasing him and he, they're all back up because they think he has something in his hand and then he opens his hand and there's nothing there and he just laughs. Oh, yep. it's good. That is the power yeah. of the Phantom. So good. Um, and just any scene where he's under under the water with his little straw. <laughs> oh, so good. Like that never happens with the Claude Range version. Oh, um, he's no. always he's always immaculately dressed. Right. He would never jump into the water. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's on my list too, man. It's great. If you haven't seen All it, right. it, yeah. Um, um so we both got that one in. I'll jump yeah. to my next one. Um, my next one, this would if it were on here, it would be close to the bottom of the list because the film overall isn't great, but it's historically significant uh, because in this set, we have Bela Lugosi's first film. We have Boris Karloff's first film, uh, Claude Rains. Right. Um, but uh, we don't actually have Lon Chaney's Jr.'s first horror film for Universal, which was Man Made Monster. Right. Um, it's not, again, it's not great. It's kind of a riff on Frankenstein. He mm-hmm. plays a man who is, um, has, whose body has adapted to electricity, and Lionel Atwell is a mad scientist who turns him into a supercharged sort of zombie. Right. Um, it's, um, God, it is actually, it is very short. I'm pretty sure it's only about 61 minutes. It's one of the shortest films. Um, but it it is proof that Cheney was their perfect choice in that era because he does right. give a great performance as Dynamo Dan. Um, <laughs> Damn, I should be using that, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and like most of Cheney's horror films, it is it is also just super depressing because he's not... He's not an evil character. He's, right. you know, he's just under the control of a of an evil character and right. could have survived this film. Right. But he doesn't. And there's a cute dog in it. And, you know, he and the dog have the bond and the dog is just super depressed. So right. it's 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 it's, you know, it's great for Cheney, but you're not getting really anything fresh from it. Right. right. So, uh, yeah. No, good choice. Good choice. Um, I'm going to go with the black cat. Uh, that's also on my list. Bella and Karloff together. Yep. Satanic rituals, dead women collection, Bella skinning Karloff. Come on, man. It's great. <laughs> um, while we're on that, um, I picked, also picked the black cat, uh, to go with that. I would say the Raven. Yep. Yep. It's on here too. I knew you were going to do it. <laughs> yep. Uh, both these films really don't have much to do with Poe. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, thematically, yes. And visually, right. they sound like they come out of Poe, but they do not follow no. the poems and stories. Yeah. Um, but they are fun. Um, the Raven has some wonderful torture devices and not, I don't think it's as grisly as the Black Cat. I think the Black Cat is is better overall. Yeah. Um, but those two go hand in hand together. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I yeah, I... What is uh what's your next one? Um this is one I don't it's not that great. The mole people. <laughs> it's okay. not great, but I like it. <laughs> that yeah, that one um that one is another 50s one. So it would go hand in hand with Creature from the Black Lagoon yeah. more than the older films. Yeah. Um I should note um so far all of the films we've listed um have been released um right. by um, with Phantom of the Opera, it's typically the best versions of that you're going to find are going to be like released by Kino Lorber. Mm-hmm. Um, with the, all these other films, they've all been released in some way by uh, Scream Factory. Right. Um, I love that label so yeah, much, and do. I need to get their Universal films. Yeah. Those are they, unfortunately they bundle those most of them in uh, four packs and are expensive. Right. right. Um, uh, yeah, the Mole People. It's fun. It's got all that Hollow Earth nonsense that I. Have. That I love, uh, mutant mole men. Yeah, it's lots of fun. Yep that that's another one too. That uh, when when they get into the uh, whole merchandising thing, they almost always release right like the mole people along with all their right. other monsters. Right. Um, even though 
even though the mole men themselves aren't really the monsters. No, no. But they look they're cool. Just, they're just <laughs> ugly as heck. Yeah. But yeah, I like it. It's got all this, you know, uh, what's the word? Freud, Fordian from Charles Ford. All this like pseudoscience nonsense. That it's great. There's like Lemuria and like I said, Hollow Earth and it's fun. Yep. <laughs> uh, I would, uh, the other one I would add, how many more did I add? I did this in my head. I should have written it down. Um, one for sure I would also throw in there, which again, thankfully has been released by Screen Factory is Murders in the Rue Morgue. Yes. Um, that was uh, that was sort of considered Bela Lugosi's consolation for Frankenstein. Um, him and Robert Flory, who was originally attached to direct Frankenstein, they got to do a very lavish um, production of Rue Morgue, which rips rips its visuals right out of the German expressionist films. Yeah. It's very cool. Um, and also also another very unsettling film. Yeah. Those early 30s ones, particularly Black Cat and Rue Morgue, are, yeah, they're a little unnerving. Yeah. Some of the torture stuff that happens yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've also got uh, Old Dark House, James oh Whale. My, that is absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that also is one that I believe is like fallen into public domain or right. something because Universal has never released it. Yeah, and it's. Good. Um, I think I think there's a Blu-ray of it now. It might be Kino Lorber, um, but yeah, one of those, one of those distributors has got a hold of it. So right. that's one that, yeah, that is a good. Again, not it's not a monster movie, but it is it is a creepy, and not haunted house, but it is a creepy. Yeah, it's film. yeah, it's kind of like a haunted house film, it's, and it's funny. It's yeah, it's, it's great. James, it, you know, again, James Well directing Ernest Thesiger before he did Bride of Frankenstein. Um, great film Clef as the mute butler or whatever he is. Great. Yeah, that's great. It's creepy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have one more. And that is just because I think they made a huge mistake in not rounding out the Abbott and Costello films. And that is, where is Abbott and Costello meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? I understand that it's not attached to a franchise like the other right. uh, Abbott and Costello films. But hey, they threw in Phantom of the Opera. Right. Um, you know, and Jekyll and Hyde, um, God, I didn't even rewatch this film because I don't even know if it's in the vault of my dad's collection, except on a VHS, which I can't access right. anymore. Um, but it's, it's, I recall it was fun because you got to have Boris Karloff playing Jekyll right? and Glenn Strange actually appears as the monster in a wax museum. So it's not, you know, yeah, he's not a live monster, but it's, it's fun to see him. Yeah, it is. So they should, I, I feel like they should have rounded out that part. Well, my last one is the body snatchers again. Karloff and Lugosi together. Uh, yeah. That one, though, is not universal. Is it not? Nope. It's uh, sure? Columbia, I believe. I thought I looked it up. Well, never mind then. But still, go it's, check it out. It's, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, no, it, it's one you should check out for sure um, if you've not seen it because it is Karloff and Lugosi um, doing their thing. Yeah. Being super creepy. Yeah, based on the Burke and Hare murders, and yeah. ooh, it's good. It's real good. I thought I could have sworn that maybe it's just because Scarlett and Lugosi together. <laughs> yeah, they, it was very rare to see them cast together in a non-universal film. So, right. um, and I think it it wasn't particularly. You didn't see Karloff do too many non-universal films yeah. either. Lugosi did a lot because mm -hmm. after Karloff kind of took over. Universal, Universal yeah. dropped him, which is stupid. Yeah, they they were really lame to do that. So there's a lot like Lugosi did, like Return of the Vampire, which is a fun little vampire film. Not not on the level of Dracula, but it's still a good one. Uh, the Bowery Boys meet a gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's uh, in a lot of a lot of clunkers, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, that uh, we have talked a lot about these films, and that brings us to uh, to the end of the show and our, our little trivia segment. Tonight's multiple-choice trivia question was submitted by me because 
I keep forgetting to ask people to submit multiple choice trivia questions. If you would like to submit a multiple choice trivia question and try to stump our panel, you can submit it to fisheyelensseesall at gmail.com. <laughs> so we've talked a bit about author Kurt Seodmak tonight. So obviously Kurt Seodmak wrote The Wolfman. Um, in watching some of these films again, I noticed that he uh, contributed to several more that I did not realize. Hmm. So my question for you is, which of the following four films did he not contribute to? Okay. Was it was it A, Son of Dracula, B, House of Frankenstein, C, House of Dracula, or D, Invisible Agent? I remember you're picking the one he did not contribute Ooh, to. Yeah. Man. It feels like Invisible Agent, but I almost feel like you're throwing me a curveball with that one. <laughs> I'm going to say that one, though. I'm going to say Invisible Agent. You're going to say Invisible Agent. Yeah. I'm so sorry. The correct answer is House of Dracula. Did it. (laughs) So, yeah, he he actually contributed to some of these shouldn't come as a surprise. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Right. Makes Um, sense. (laughs) House of Frankenstein, uh, Invisible Agent, and The Invisible Woman. Wow. Um, That is our episode. It went I thought I thought we were only going to be talking about these movies for about an hour, and uh, we've gone over three. That just goes to show how much uh, we love these old films. Yes, we do. Um, and uh, there's a there's a great kind of dumb uh, anthology trailer film called Frankenstein: The Cinematic Scrapbook um, that we have both seen quite a few times. And at, at, as I recall, at the end of that. Um, they, they say something effective, uh, you know, when, when Freddy has, uh, invaded his last nightmare, when Jason has slashed his last victim, um, you know, studios will always go back to Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same can be said of a lot of these character types and, uh, kudos to like other studios over the years for shepherding these monsters, kudos to hammer for changing up the game Mm -hmm. kudos to it's not my favorite but you know bram stoker's dracula delivered to a modern audience right um you know that first mummy movie yeah but shame on you van helsing shame (laughs) yep so these these monsters uh they are eternal as long as there is film there will be a place for these monsters all right. So that, that is our episode. So thank you for watching. Um, wow. It went so much longer than I thought. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for, for joining me in this quest to, you know, on, buddy. to try and figure out what is the best, even though they're all kind of the best. Go see Except, all of them. Go see yeah. all of them. Just, just pick, pick up this box set. It's, it's not expensive. <laughs> yeah. You can't. That, okay. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. Um, again, uh, if you have any comments, questions, blah, 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 uh, <laughs> we're on Facebook at facebook.com backslash truth and film, on Twitter at Sunday underscore matinee. You can email me at fisheyelenseesall at gmail.com. And if you're watching this on YouTube, congratulations, you have found us on YouTube. Like and subscribe, because <laughs> that's actually the only way you can watch these videos. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Have a happy, happy Halloween. Yes. Um, we'll be back to doing fun Halloween stuff. Probably starting next September. I'll start a week early again because uh, this is the, just the best time of the year. It sure is. <laughs> so on that note, everyone, have a spectacular and spooky evening. <laughs>